Well, hi, everybody. This is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. And we're here to talk about Rule One Investing and Enlightened Investing and Values Investing and how to figure out how to go out there and make some great returns the way the best investors in the world have done it, including Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Manesh Pabrai. If I were you, I'd be making a list. Uh, <laughs> David Einhorn. <laughs> David Einhorn. Bill Ackman. Uh, Dan Loeb. Oh, my well, gosh. The talking, list goes we're on. We're talking about what on earth these people are doing, including you, and how other people can do it, because I certainly don't know. Yeah, that's the thing, is that investing is really simple, but so is snowboarding. So right. is riding a bike. Right. You know, and we need some training wheels. And so we're going to have to kind of explain the basic ideas behind investing, which are really simple. Um, last time we had Charlie Munger lay them out there for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even more than explaining it, we're just, you know, talking about them, talking about understanding them. Yeah. Diving in a I little deeper. I think there's deeper. a lot more to, um, to the conversation. Yeah. I mean, th these are simple ideas, but simple can be profound and it right. requires a bit of explanation. So much so that, you know, I've been studying this since 1980 and I still learn every time I read uh, a book written by a, what we call a rule one investor. By the way, maybe I should explain what a rule one investor is. Yeah. We, we're grouping all of these investors together who follow this basic principle of investing that says that uh, from Warren Buffett that says there's just two rules of investing. There's rule number one, which is don't lose money. And rule number two, which is don't forget rule number one. And what that means is that we focus on the downside so intensely, like we just are really intent on not losing money. And our basic principle is that if this investment meets our other requirements, there's, it's going to have a nice upside potential. What we want to be sure of is that it doesn't have a nice downside potential right along with it. Because if we get it right once in a while, we're going to do great. If we got it right 40% of the time, we're going to knock it out of the park. We'll make 26, 30% a year. The key is the other 60% of the time when we're wrong, we're wrong, but we don't lose money. There's, there's a base there. Wait, is that true? Yeah, How yeah. How can you be wrong and not lose money? Well, because we buy with a huge margin of safety, which in this series that we're going to talk about. Yeah, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to. Okay. But I, so I don't want to get too caught up in that. But there are some safeguards on this process, and margin of safety is one of them. Um, we're going to talk about other safeguards, which include, uh, most importantly, looking at the um, moat of the business, that it's a durable, competitive business. And essentially, you know, Warren Buffett was on, on uh, CNBC not too long ago, and, he, and it was clear that he was buying John Deere Tractor, so John Deere Tractor Company. And it's in big trouble. And so the people who were interviewing him say, well, how do you know, you know, you want to, how do you know this is going to be good and all this? And he says, look, all I know is that 10 years from now, it's going to be worth more than it is today. In other words, he's certain he's going to make money. He just doesn't know how much or, or when, but the downside is for, for Warren in that investment, the downside doesn't exist. There's not going to be a problem with this company. Okay. I feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Yeah, we are. Let's step back. Because I'm missing the, the beginnings of that. Okay, so let's so step can back. We, can we step back and listen to Charlie Munger? Again? Yeah. It's going to take a whole minute. It takes a whole minute. All right, do it. I feel like he's important enough. <laughs> go, Charlie. Okay, here we go. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding. And then once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage. And then, of course, we would vastly prefer a management in place with a lot of integrity and talent. And finally, no matter how wonderful it is, it's not worth an infinite price. So we have to have a price that makes sense. And so that's what you were just saying. Gives a margin. That the price has to be good enough to where you know beyond some reasonable doubt that you'll be able to make some money. Yeah. Or not lose it. That's all. Hmm. That's the key thing is that, you, okay, I'm not going to lose money on this deal. Um, Manesh Prabhai says that's where he focuses most of his attention on how do you get smoked on this thing? 
And Charlie Munger, and we'll talk about these things later, but Charlie Munger is just like, look, the main thing you have to do is take the story that you've created about this company and how wonderful it is and how great the price is and invert it and make the case that it sucks and it's totally unreasonable to be buying it at this price. Make that case and then rebut your own case. So let's go back to what we were talking about last time, which was being capable of understanding, which is the first point that he said. Yeah. And we talked a lot about sort of the basis of knowledge that is a good idea to have by reading paper and watching the news and kind of knowing what's happening around the world financial wise and otherwise. And then from there, it be kind of becomes a practice of every day, just checking what's going on, having a general base of knowledge. And getting deeper in specific areas that you've chosen. We, we call that... Once you've got the base though, right? Well, no, you're going to start in right off the bat. We, we, li we like to get people realizing that you can really understand a lot about certain businesses. And that, you know, fair enough, the majority of businesses, you can't understand those businesses well enough to be invested in them. But there are businesses that you can understand and you might as well start digging in on them. So one of the things that I like to see people do is write down everything they're passionate about, write down everything that they're talented in, write down everything that they make money doing, and write down where they're spending their money. And see if there isn't a number of things that are in all of those areas, mm -hmm. right? And then look into the marketplace of what, what they call industry groups and subgroups um, that you can look up on Value Line. You can look it up on our website at, at Rule One Investing. You can look it up on a lot of different websites and see if you can find companies in that in that area that you already know. Let's say you're a teacher, and so you really love education. You're passionate about it. You're good at it. You make your money doing it. All right, great. So this is a focal point for you to start digging that canyon. You know, start getting in deep. You might be really, really a knowledgeable teacher, but you don't know anything about buying an educational company. Right. There's that huge gulf between what you do every day maybe as a teacher and an educational company that's being run by people you've never heard of that create a product that maybe you like but don't know that much about. I mean, to me, that seems like an almost insurmountable gulf. Well, let's let's take it. I mean, insurmountable mountains, right, are, are sometimes handled one step at a time. And if you look at them um, that way you can say, okay, well, I might not be able to get to the top of the mountain right now, but I can certainly walk up these foothills here. So one so of the what things, would a, foot help a foothill will be understanding that investing in a business requires that you know the same things you would need to know if you were going to be an entrepreneur and be in that business. Hmm. So you don't, you know, being an entrepreneur is a talented it's a loaded thing, right? I mean, it, some people are extremely talented entrepreneurs and some are not. But the knowledge base for being an entrepreneur is the same as being an investor. So for example, um, if I wanted to be an, uh, an entrepreneur and start a hamburger place, like, you know, your grandmother did, started a little restaurant in Sausalito. And, you know, she needs to know certain things about how do you run a restaurant. Yeah. Like what are the key things you need to know? Like you need to know that a typical restaurant has about one third of its cost in labor and about one third of its cost in food. And if you're exceeding one third of the cost in food, you're probably not going to be a profitable restaurant. Gee, I literally didn't know that because I've never worked in a restaurant. I know. But that stuff's written down. It's written down lots of places. Um, so you wouldn't probably go buy a McDonald's franchise and open up a McDonald's store without having first worked there a while, right? Mm -hmm. To get the sense if you like that kind of job, if you like that career, if making burgers is your thing, but also to learn how the business works. Well, the beauty of being an investor over an entrepreneur is we don't have to flip the burgers. We don't have to clean the grill. We don't have to clean the toilets or the floor, but we do have to know the things that the manager would have to know. What are we shooting for here? What are the key numbers to look at? I think that's such an important point. And right. You have to have the basics of what that business is about before you can evaluate it. Yeah. If you don't know in your terms what that business is about or what Charlie's saying is you don't understand the business 
or what I say is like if, if the business isn't meaningful to you in a deep sense, then you really have no way to have, you don't have the tools to figure out what it's worth. Absolutely. If you don't have the tools to figure out what it's worth, you can't buy it because you don't know what the heck you're doing. All right, doing. so I'm reading the papers. I've got my Barron subscription. I'm all over the Wall Street Journal. I still know nothing about restaurants. Let's say for some reason I desperately want to invest in restaurants. I love my Chipotle. How, what's the next? Where do you go? What's the next step? Well, I think you said it right there. You love your Chipotle. So that's the next step. That's the one to start with, the one you love. No, but I think there's a step that you just described, which is sort of a general knowledge about the financials of restaurants. Ah, well, I guess we could get there from a general reading books from Amazon on what you need to know to start a restaurant, right? Okay. And that's probably perfectly reasonable. I haven't actually gone at it like that, but why not? Let's go on Amazon and, I don't know, let's go on Amazon and see what the heck they've got for <laughs> restaurants. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that and you talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, so restaurants, there's probably some knowledge on the internet about restaurants. And I, I think, you know, my mind then goes to what about a more obscure industry that um, – that there aren't, you know, shows on Bravo about. So, but, but we don't. We don't need to go into an obscure industry. Almost, I'd say 80, 60 to eighty percent of Warren Buffett's investments are in non-obscure industries. They are, they are, real simple industries. I mean, Warren always says you don't want to jump over a six foot bar. You want to jump over a one foot bar. Um, you want to make it absolutely black and white. You have no question. There's no gray area. Look, here's one right here. I just did Amazon. All right. Restaurant business plan, how to open a restaurant startup and be profitable within the first year by Corey Sutherland. I don't know if Corey knows anything, <laughs> but the book calls $2.99, you know? That's cheap. Restaurant success by the numbers. Second edition. So this one's been around long enough to get printed twice. And I would buy that. A guide to opening the next new hotspot. Restaurant manager's handbook, how to set up, operate, and manage a financially successful food op. So it's all, it's so much information available. The problem really becomes focusing on what you want to really get good at, right? You got all these things you could get good at. So let's just say you're going to go get good at the re restaurant business. Mm -hmm. Well, there's three books right there. And that would probably take you a week to read each one. So, you know, because you got a life. So you just go, sure. here's number one bestseller in business facility management. There we go. That's the restaurant manager's handbook. So you read that and you're going to know every number, every key number that you would need to know to manage a restaurant. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, all right. And so what we were talking about last time was the tension between knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know and how difficult it is to stop yourself at the point where your knowledge ends. Right. So and knowing where that is. Yeah. Right. So if I'm somebody who's, you know, going to read three books about restaurants, which, you know, really is a great source, and I'm sure I would know a lot about restaurants at the end of that, still, it's difficult to know where my knowledge ends. Oh, well, at that point, it's not, because you know you still don't know. You think know. there's enough at that? Oh, you see, there's not <laughs> enough. <laughs> You've read three books. You're you're not an expert yet. All right. So, I feel like an expert though in my <laughs> mind. I can talk about it at dinner parties. Which which takes us really into another area that we have to explore here, and that is how important emotions are in the investing process, controlling them, and how critical it is that you you do a self evaluation hmm. and really know yourself. That good investors know themselves very well. They know their weaknesses. And they know their strengths. And and part of knowing yourself is having a fairly humble view of what it is you know you know. Okay? But also keep in mind that we don't have to be right every time. In fact, we're not going to be right every time. What we have to do is not be wrong about the downside. That's the main thing, right? And as we go through these major areas that we focus on, we're going to handle the downside. We're not going to buy anything. I'll just give you the quick hint here is we're not buying anything unless in our view, now a fairly well-educated view, having read books, having read 10Ks, having read analyst reports, we have a pretty educated view on what the overall value of this business is because that's what everybody's trying to figure out. And then we're going to buy it for half of that or we're not going to buy it at all. So we're going to get ourselves a huge margin of safety 
And that protects our downside, at least theoretically, right? You just made a jump for me, um, and maybe we'll get to this later, between general knowledge about this industry from reading the books, from reading the newspapers, et cetera, to knowing the value of a specific business. Yes. That sounds like a huge jump. No, it's an evolutionary move. It's not a huge jump. It's like you need to go through this hurdle of understanding the industry before you can possibly make a judgment about the value of a business in that industry. So the first thing is, okay, how do I figure out what the numbers should be on a, on a, on a restaurant? Um, how do they compete with each other? How dangerous are they? How easy is it to go broke? You know, what are the key things there? And then we just pick one. Pick, you said pick Chipotle. a random restaurant. Okay. Sure, not random. Something we really like and we go and visit it and we eat there. Okay. So we're, we're a place we're spending our money and we really like the place a lot. And we feel that it's something that should be in the world 20 years from now. So let's take Chipotle for example. Um, then you start, what you do then is you start to read the government documents on that thing before you read anything else. When you start to go into a company, you read the government documents. And the reason you read the government documents, which are the 10Ks and the 10Qs filed with the SEC. And, you, and the 10K is their annual report and the 10Qs are their quarterly reports. Right. And, and the annual report's the main one to read. Um, and what I would recommend doing is starting back maybe in 2008, because we've had such turbulence in the last few years, I would start like in 2008 and read forward. So now you're, you're going to Chipotle's website, you go to Investor Relations tab, and you click it, and down will come a list of things, including SEC filings. Click that, look for the little thing that says 10K, and go back to 2008 and read those. Um, each one of them, you know, probably of, of information about the business, you're talking about a few pages, five or six pages. So you're going to read forward, read forward, read forward, read forward for the last six or seven years. And by the time you're done reading those things, you will, you will see how this restaurant manages itself, what it thinks of its competition, where it thinks it's going to go. And you'll have a good idea if it's producing what it says it was going to produce each year. Are you talking about reading just the text that the company provides? Yeah. You're not talking about initially. reading the financial statements initially. Initially. Now, cuz those, you know, those 10Ks are 100 to 200 pages and most of them are financial statements. Right. And then there's a part at the beginning where the company describes what it's been doing and where it's going and all the risk factors that yeah, they have. Yeah, called business. <laughs> it's called business. And then right. you have management's uh, discussion of the business. That's what I want you to read. Read the text. And you can leave the numbers alone initially, right? We're we definitely coming back to them, but mm -hmm. leave them alone for right now. Okay. There's, it, the reason is because is there's a lot of numbers on those pages. And there's only like seven or eight of them you really have to know anything about. You know, a lot about anyway. Um, so now you've read what the management's talking about, about its business, and you've done it for like six or seven years. You're going to have a really good idea about what that company's up to. You'll have seen it go, go from 200 restaurants to 400 to 800 to 1,200 over that period of time. And then you can, you can see what management is saying about, hmm, how many more can we do, right? How about increasing the profitability in our restaurants? And you can begin to understand from the position of somebody who might own a Chipotle what they're all about, right? Now, as part of that, you're going to read about their competition. Hmm. Now go do the same thing with their top two competitors hmm. and just read through. Now, some of those competitors are private. You're not going to get your hands on that information, but some of them are public. And what you're doing here is we call it just cutting the walls of the canyon. You're, you're, you're digging deep to become good at that one part of the restaurant industry, sort of fast, natural, whatever they're calling it, right? <laughs> it's like the new cutting edge of what's going on. People are cutting into McDonald's hamburger business because they're producing naturally uh, um, grass-fed natural beef like it, at Five Guys. and all. It's a new wave, and I think it's a long-term wave. So I you're hope in, it is. Yeah, I hope it is. And so by reading... And that's the values conversation, which we can get to, like investing in something that you want to support with your dollars, voting with your dollars in a sense. It is huge. So right now we're just basically saying, you know, take a shot at something you already really like. 
what we really should do is be specific that what we want to do is match our values and our money. In other words, we want to put our, let's say we say these are my values, right? This is my value. This is my value. This is my, this is what I think is good. And we're teaching our children that now put your money where your mouth is. If, if you're all about healthy food, then why would you own McDonald's? It's not healthy food, right? Right. But if you have a mutual fund, you probably own McDonald's. Hmm. And so this, is, now, this one gets me because we're, we become hypo hypocrites without intending to, you know? And I, I don't think that's a good thing. I, I think it's really important that we are people of integrity, which means we're sort of, what you see is what you get a person of integrity. And, and part of that is we do what we say we're going to do. And part of that is our money. So if we say we're all about natural food and health food, but we spend our money in McDonald's and drink and Coke, then what are we saying? We, we don't mean it, right? Because I think values are what you do, not what you say you do. I agree. You know, it's interesting. It's something I think about a lot with um, with startup companies that I work with that want to be benefit corporations or um, L3Cs, which are new legal forms of companies that have a social component to them. So they put actually in their governing documents and create a separate kind of entity that says that they have some spe either specific or general social component that they are committed to. And then their shareholders can hold them to that. So it's a little different from a normal corporation where um, shareholders wouldn't have any recourse. Well, for give me an example of that. What, what's a, a social obligation that a company might put in there? So books? like Tom's Shoes is a great example where they have made as part of their business model putting out one pair of shoes for every pair of shoe pair of shoes that's purchased, they send another pair of shoes to Africa um, to give shoes to people who need shoes. And people who purchase shoes here maybe will buy a pair of Tom's shoes that they don't like as much as another pair of shoes because they want to provide that slight bit of social justice to somebody else. Uh -huh. And I've certainly bought Tom's shoes because of that. I still like their shoes. I bought you guys both. You did. Tom's you are the first person who introduced me to them, <laughs> which was totally your very cutting edge. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a classic example. And now so many other companies are following that one for one model, and Tom's Shoes is expanding it into eyeglasses. And I think they're putting out a wine, like all sorts I of things. I think that's freaking great. It's so cool. Yeah. And they made it part of their business model. I actually don't know. Um, what their entity is. I don't know if they're a regular corporation or if they're one of these benefit corporations. Um, but it doesn't really matter, frankly. I mean, from my perspective, this is not legal advice. But um, it, it doesn't truly matter in terms of how they run their business. So, you know, some people want to vote with their dollars literally by consuming various things. You choose one pair of shoes or a different pair of shoes. And other people maybe want to vote with their dollars by investing in supporting certain supporting those companies mm -hmm. that are are choosing to be explicitly socially conscious. I mean, every company out there is socially something, right? I mean, McDonald's has a point of view. Right. It's an interesting conundrum that I think about sometimes because when you start to break it down as far as values, you get to the point eventually where you say, well, any new business employs people. And that's a value that I have. Yes. That people should be employed, gainfully employed. Support the community by starting a business in your community. Support the real estate market by opening an office there. You know, there's so many different yeah. ways that a business supports people besides just their product, besides just their actual business model. I love that you're saying that. Yeah, but I mean, you can get there. But on the other hand, you know, there's companies that do things that are arguably very unsavory. So they still employ people, but whatever it is they do is not so good in a lot of people's eyes. So there's kind of, you know, it's, I think it's a real, it's, for me, it's a, it's a conundrum. I hate to use that word. I, I, I took a class on ethics when I was studying in college, and the, the questions that were asked in this class were really strange. Like, why don't we eat children? You know, right. things like that. <laughs> And um, the questions that will drive you insane. Yeah, the ones like, well, of course we don't, you know, but that's usually not a good answer in a f philosophy class. Right. So you really have to defend your your 
point of view. And I'm, I'm remembering that uh, one defense that that came up about, you know, why do we eat cattle but not children? Or why do vegetarians think, you know, we should eat grass and not cattle and whatever? Is that one, one person put it that you eat as low on the consciousness chain as you can. It's kind of as one way of thinking of it. So there's a continuum from that point of view. And there's no black and white place where you sort of jump off. It's sort of up to you. And I, I'd like that answer for this, right? Because you have this continuum. You have uh, virtually every employer is good that they employ somebody and give someone a chance who needs a job. Um, but at the cost of yeah, with you know, con- assuming it's good working conditions and all of that. Yeah, and all that. Stuff, or yeah. even, even if it isn't good working conditions. I'm thinking about people who employ people in Kenya on ranches and, you know, they're living in mud huts and working in a sweat house kitchen and there's no air conditioning. And, you know, I mean, it's not lovely. Yeah. But, but they want the job. They want the job. Yeah. For that dollar a day. Yeah. So and there's also is that other person, sort of larger issues around that. Yeah, I mean, that is that person an to, evil person for moving to Kenya and right. employing maybe, these people? Maybe they are. I don't know. Or are they a savior for moving to Kenya and taking the risk of getting Mau Mau'd and employing these people? Oh, so I don't depends. know. It's, it depends how much they're exploiting the people, I think. And I think the point here is that you need to be a conscious human being. We need to be conscious. That's right. And I think that's the point is it's not for either of us to say, right, here's what your value should be, you know, support blood diamonds in Africa or don't support blood (laughs) diamonds in Africa. Generally, let's not support them. But if you have some reasons for whatever, who knows why you're into them, like, okay, fine, do your thing. Well, I mean, you know how big I am on cloning uh, great investors' investment decisions. And we will definitely talk about that down the road, not in this particular podcast, but I mean, think about it. Warren Buffett loves to buy stuff like Dairy Queen, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all of which I try at this point in my life to avoid like the plague. Right. Right. And and so they don't fit my view of what I want to see promoted in the world the next 20 years. But, you know, Buffett's 85 and he isn't going to change. And he drinks seven Cokes a day. So, OK, it supports his view of the world. He's making his value call and backing it with his money. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. why not me do this? Why wouldn't I want to do the same thing? And, and I just have to be more conscious and more aware that when I'm putting my money to work in the hands of a fund manager, they're going to vote for me. And they're going to vote for McDonald's, Coke, Pepsi, and Dairy Queen. They're going to do it because they're owning 200 stocks or 300 stocks. Guaranteed, there will be a pile of stocks in there that are completely the opposite of my values. Is that a mutual fund manager? Yeah, okay. mutual fund manager. And so, you know, I mean, basically all you gotta do is look at how many stocks your mutual fund manager owns, and I promise you there's stocks in there you don't wanna own relative to your value set. So when we started to talk about doing this kind of investing, one of the reasons I love that people are starting to do it is because they're starting to take control of their own money and, and vote it according to their values. And that's, that's fantastic. Not my values, not Warren's values, but your values. You pick the stuff that you think you want to see in the world and buy it when it's on sale. Mm-hmm. Have you ever bought something that you did not agree with, but you knew it was such a good deal and you just had to do it? I've bought stuff that, yeah, you know, consciousness is an evolution, right? I mean, it's, I think we're conscious, we, we're constantly evolving our consciousness. If we try to be an aware person, we're going to be a better person in 20 years than we are today. And so we're not, well, hopefully, Let's hope you're not. laughing at me. No, I'm not. I'm saying generally, <laughs> general laughing. <laughs> you know me a long time, you know. I hope you think I've gotten better, but we'll, we'll leave we that all, out of the point. Don't answer that. Don't we answer all that. We'll get better. <laughs> so, Here's, here's what I find myself doing is I find myself being a bit unconscious when I see a super good deal. I, I've had that issue. Like I bought Coke not more than three years ago because well, it was on sale. it's an emotional reaction of, oh my gosh, I have to get in on this. Yeah. I mean, that's money just sitting there. Right. Right. And I kind of knew that I was on my way to exit the sugar thing. And I kind of, and I totally knew that I've been addicted to Coca-Cola's forever So I'm thinking, you know, I don't really love, I want to get off of Coca-Cola and now I'm going to go own the company that makes the drug, right? Mm -hmm. I want to get off heroin, but I'm going to, 
really, this heroin company is really on sale. I don't mind if other people buy it. Yeah. I'll just own it. I just won't use it. You know, <laughs> that's probably not real conscious investing. So I've done that. And I've also done it, done, I, I tend to enter a position maybe a little earlier than I should in terms of what I know about the business just to make myself really get involved and really dig in. Oh, and, yeah. You mentioned that last time. Yeah. And I've done I've done companies where when I realized what they were doing, I was actually appalled. Hmm. Um, but it took me a little while. It took mm-hmm. me some digging. Because mm-hmm. they're not going to just put that out there. No, it, it looked yeah. good on the surface. It looked like, a, you know, what they were doing. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about a company that buys people's life insurance policies. It seemed like a good idea at the time. But there was room in there for them to behave badly. And they did, hmm. right? And so I was in it for like three days. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, these guys are actually the potential here is for bad behavior. And usually, when there's that potential, it'll come around, especially if they're not explicitly avoiding that bad behavior. Well, I think that's you just said something really interesting, which is maybe it's not so important that they employ people and support local real estate and all those sort of basic things that just a business existing does because we're actually going to identify with that business. And if the people who are running it are not following our values, we know that at some point they probably will change that business even farther away from where we want it to go. And that will probably also hurt the dollar bottom line as yeah, well as the I would, bottom I line. would agree with that completely. That, you know, we, we want to get a business that's tough for people to change mm-hmm. also. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the inverse of that. Like, let's get a business that has a model that's not very easy to screw up. Right? You, they know, wh- look, we're going to get natural pork on grass-fed hogs and we're going to have really high quality ingredients, probably on our way to organic at some point. And we're going to keep this business really simple. It's going to, you know, you come in, you get a burrito and you get some iced tea and there you go. Um, That's going to be a harder business to screw up than say Micron making chips or these guys doing life insurance policies or something like that. So we want to, we want to make sure that the business is really simple, really easy to understand, and it matches our value set. So that we are excited about telling our kids like, hey, honey, I own Whole Foods and, you know, you shop there. How awesome is that? I'm an owner. In fact, I would push it this far. I would say if you go buy one share of something, think of it exactly emotionally the same as if you just bought the entire company and now it's yours and so is all the karma surrounding that company. That's different from what you said earlier though, which is that sometimes you buy a little bit before you know enough about it to really identify That's that true. Company. I do cheat my way in a tad. And you actually, you know, said that you use that tool to force yourself I do. to so uh, I'm gonna, continue your research. I'm gonna, I, I, you're absolutely right. I'm contradicting myself. So I'll, I'll rephrase it to say that when you've made the final decision to really step into this investment, you're not going to, unless you don't have very much money or unless you're buying Berkshire Hathaway, which is $190,000 a share, you're <laughs> not going to just be buying one share. You're going to be loading up the truck. And this is, we haven't gotten there yet, but this is where we're going. And this is why we're spending time on on your value set and your emotions and how to get your understanding to a place where it's legitimate to be buying this business is because when we buy businesses, we are very not like the rest of the world. And neither is Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger or any of the rest of the guys I know. Who are we? All of us rule one investors. Oh, okay. (laughs) This whole crew of people who follow this don't lose money formula. And, And what we do to make sure we don't lose money is we really understand the businesses. And basically Warren says, look, the best way to invest is to just figure you've got a punch card with 20 punches in it for your entire lifetime. And you get to punch, you have to punch it one time each time you buy a stock, each time you buy that company, right? So you get 20 punches. And if you thought of it like that, you'd be very, very careful about punching the card. Sure. Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of adding to that idea that think of it like you're buying the whole company and you're only going to buy 20 of them in your whole life. And you'll take your time. Um, you don't have to be out there running around buying stocks all day long. In fact, 
I would argue that this is really kind of lazy man's guide to, to getting rich and it's the right way to do it. You should do it this way. Well, and maybe people who are trading, you know, less dollars and don't necessarily want to put in that first little bit just to make themselves be really committed. Maybe they maybe they can skip that step you and just do the little, research on their own. You have to have a little more discipline than I've got, say, to, <laughs> you know, to really focus in. I tend my mistakes tend to be that I I just keep I'm, I'm across this huge landscape, right? And I've I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've 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 got a lot of I've moved the walls back on the canyon pretty good in in a number of places. It's still pretty narrow, but there's more companies that I understand now than there was a long time ago, and that gives me more things to play with, more things to look at than I could ever look at. And so, you know, really digging deep is harder than looking at something and then bouncing to the next one. Harder for me, anyway. You might find it's easier to go deep. I mean, your work requires a lot of discipline and a lot of focus, um, more than mine. So maybe deep's good, but um, easier for you. But for me, I just use techniques that I've used over the years to try to figure out how to get myself to really get focused in on things, which kind of takes me to this notion that to really understand what you're doing, you've got to understand you. <laughs> well, that's a topic for <laughs> I'm, someone I'm thinking more we need to do this in, than either of us. I'm, I'm thinking, well, that's for sure, and and probably way out of our field. But I'm thinking you really got to just raise the point that self awareness is incredibly important. Yeah. To being a yeah. good investor. Yeah. No, I take your point on that. I mean, I think um, in general, in life, self awareness is incredibly important, and as you said, we're constantly trying to get better every day, every year. And um, and your values change over time, as you just described. Sure, they do. They change over time, and when they change, you might discover that oh, yeah, I really don't want to be in that Coca Cola thing anymore. I don't want to own Coke. I don't want to support it into the future. Um, and basically, line up your values this way: use the products of the companies that you own as much as possible. Right? I mean, why not? I mean, when when Warren Buffett does his you know Woodstock for capitalists thing every May in Omaha, and 30,000 people show up. Um, he pitches his diamond company, his furniture company, you know, the insurance company. He owns Geico. He's pitching all these companies from the stage with a, with a grin. <laughs> because what he's basically saying is, look, this is how you do it. I own a few companies. I love the products. I love the people. I understand them deeply. And they fit my value system. And I want you guys to enjoy these products as much as I do. And if you feel like that, you're, you're going down the road pretty good to get an understanding about this business. And what Charlie said is, you got to buy businesses you are capable of understanding. So when you start going through this process of kind of peeling the onion of this business, at some point you might actually find that you don't get it. That you run into a wall of, of clarity Hmm. things are just unclear and mm -hmm. you don't understand why the business is explaining itself in the 10 K the way it is. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you, you don't know. You can feel that there's something out there. That's the deal. You're feeling the tension. So you either keep digging or you just go, this one's too hard. It, I find that feeling very uncomfortable. It should be It's like literally uncomfortable to me. I think it's sort of nature's way of warning you to back off. Yeah. Warren, Warren Buffett, according to Guy Spear, who's another hedge fund manager, was in his office, has a, a box on his office that is labeled too hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And he throws stuff into it. <laughs> so get used to it. You're going to be... I mean, if Buffett is throwing things regularly into a box that says too hard... What about the rest of us? We're going to have a lot more stuff going into that box. So really pay attention to that tension. Really pay attention to your values. Yeah, that requires a real sense of personal awareness, um, a sense of what's happening almost like in your body when you're doing something intellectually and you start to feel that prickle of uncomfortableness. I feel that in my body. And it's, it's, it's physically uncomfortable. And it's easy to ignore. It's easy to say, oh, that's something else. I ate something weird. You know, like I had a bad <laughs> workout today. Whatever. I'm tired. 
um, it's very easy to write off because it's subtle. And I think for me, anyway, a big part of the awareness practice is just noticing what's happening to me as I go through a day, as I go through my research. Well, I'll tell you, I'm 100% with you. Um, I know you listen to Andy Stanley's podcast. He's the the uh, uh, pastor at North Point Church out in Atlanta. And Melissa and I go there mm-hmm. when we can. And we watch him every Sunday. So he's our church. And, um, and Andy's phenomenal. And he gave a whole lecture series on this idea of pay attention to the tension hmm. in terms of just making decisions in your life about where to go forward. Well, you know, where you put your money for your long-term investment and for your retirement and the future of your family is a pretty important part of what you're deciding. And so if it's huge, it's huge. So really this is a valuable technique to just have some quiet Mm -hmm. in your life and Mm -hmm. sit down. I mean, what do you do when you're trying, when you're starting to feel something, what do you do to see what's real and what's, whether you're feeling it for real or whether it's just indigestion? You know, I think that's, it's very difficult sometimes to know. Um, I just try to pay attention and just sort of take five seconds out from whatever it is I'm doing and just notice. And then maybe half an hour later, do the same thing. Just notice, see if something's changed, see how I'm feeling, see if anything's changed in what I'm reading or what I'm doing or the people around me. And um, and just really try to sort of intuit what's, what's been causing that feeling. And I also think um, for something major, like a big investment, you wait multiple days and see if that feeling is there multiple days in a row Brilliant. because if it is then you know that it's uh, maybe you know that it's related to that particular investment that you're thinking about yeah, yeah. it's which, i which mean it's flies, tough there's no good answer to it you know the idea that you, i think it's also different for each person you've got to figure out what kind of works for you but i really like what you said about taking some time um people get in a real hurry they about do, investing. right, right. And they're really encouraged in that. You feel like you're all about to media. lose out. Oh my gosh, these guys want to just get you wound up. Right? <laughs> Jim CNBC, Bloomberg. style. Exactly. I mean, they're, most of the people who are in the financial services industry um, as professionals live in New York and and are, uh, in terms of you know Wall Street, and are wound up like a clock on Bloomberg terminals. They're addicted to information flows and they're just constantly checking it. And, you know, you, you, they don't, they don't step back from that. And that noise will overwhelm the little quiet voice completely. And so I think one of our huge advantages as small investors is that ideally we don't get associated with that noise. We can live in New York and not have anything to do with the investment community. I mean, most of New York doesn't, but we don't have to live in New York. I mean, we live all over the world. And I want you to think about this because you live in Boulder. I live in, you know, south of Atlanta. Um, Buffett lives in Omaha. Manesh Prabhai lives in Irvine, California. Um, Dan Loeb lives in Malibu. I mean, these guys have chosen these places because of what we're talking about, to get out of the noise and away from New York. And um, that's so they can hear this voice, hmm. I think. And I think people can live in New York, too, and you know, hear the voice just as easily, just, just as long as they're a little bit away from the investment world. I don't, I, I'm not sure I agree with this just as easily. I love New York and I'm not going to let you disparage it. I'm not disparaging New York. I love New York. New York's great. But it's like, it's the playing field. And you're you're just right there in the middle of the game. And it's just all around you. I mean, you can't go down, you know, Times Square. There's, there's, the, st- there's the tickers going across on a big screen. New York's big, New York's this, this money capital of the world. And you can feel that in New York. I think if you're involved in that world, okay, fine. Millions of people live in New York and are not involved in that world whatsoever. But we're trying to get those people involved in that world to do rule one investing, vote their money. That starts with understanding this business, digging deep in and making sure you're aligning your values and then doing your homework. We're going to talk more about this next time because I really love this idea of what you should be looking for when you're trying to understand this business. We'll go into this concept that a business model needs to exist that has a definitive way of protecting that business from being attacked by competitors. Mm. And what does that look like? Mm. Yeah, and once you have this, I, I see the order because once you have the understanding of the general industry and the business itself, hopefully by reading all the 10 K's and all the, everything else you can find about them, then you need to know, okay, what are the actual details of what this company has going on? Yeah. So tune in next time. We'll be diving into that. 
Okay. Thanks for listening to Invested, the Rule One podcast. If you like us, please subscribe and leave a review for us on iTunes. You can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and get more information about how to invest on your own by going to ruleonepodcast.com. Everything we've discussed in this podcast is either Danielle's opinion or my opinion and is not to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.